G'day, Sean here again. And um, in this short video here, what I'm going to go is go through um, my use of ethical uh, reasoning and critical thinking and also demonstrate um, my type one and type two thinking, I guess, based around the case study that I placed in um, session one. Now, I'm not exactly going to use the, use the framework that I put into the lecture, but you can see that I cover most of those points uh, within my deliberation. Importantly, this really is not artificial. Um, it's a genuine breakdown of my thinking. I put that case study in only only a week or so ago before I'm recording this lecture. And although it's actually a fairly common uh, ethical case study, what I did is I deliberately waited until the end of the lectures and I wanted to record this lecture and break down what my thinking was. And you'll see that there is type one, type two thinking that I, that I go through. Um, and you can see the moral calculation that I use. Now, what I want you to think about this is not that I have the right answer, because we all have different moral calculations. And you can see, though, that um, your the way when you break it down yourself, you might have quite a different um, way of thinking about it than I do. So that's not necessarily wrong. But I want you to think about if we are working together and we have a patient like this, um, the kind of discussion that we might have as clinicians together in thinking about what is the right thing to do here? Um, what is the best uh, solution to the ethical problem that we have? So my initial moral intuition about this, so my, my type one thinking was initially was to obfuscate. Obfuscating doesn't mean to directly lie. It means to sort of hedge around the truth or to hide the issue. But is obfuscation lying? Well, not quite. In a sense, the kind of white lie. But what it isn't, I and mean, what it certainly isn't, is that it isn't veracity. It isn't telling the truth. All right, it's not telling the full truth. So many people, many people say, "Oh, it's not exactly lying." Well, it's not exactly lying, but it isn't according to the principle of veracity. And I want to make that really, really clear: when you don't tell the full truth, or when you hide or obfuscate elements of the truth, it isn't veracity. All right. And then this raises the first question: Why would I wish to hide the full truth? I mean, it isn't as if, as a nurse, that I'm uncomfortable with breaking bad news. Breaking um, bad news is, look, it's never enjoyable, but I'd rather break new, uh, bad news with tact, gentleness and consideration than have a family member hear bad news in sort of some other awful way. So from, from my moral intuition telling, telling me strongly that I, in this instance, I would obfuscate and um, not tell the whole truth, I really need to delve deeper into my ethical reasoning. Um, so let's go through where I headed with this. So firstly, I thought of this from a principalist viewpoint. And I also thought about it from a deontological viewpoint. And from both of those viewpoints, I really ought to tell the patient's family the exact truth, even though the news would have been terribly distressing. Because I have a duty to be honest, which is fidelity, um, and to tell the truth, veracity, irrespective of the outcome. Now, that's my uh, one of my uh, one of my and or our professional and um, ethical duties is truth telling, but. From a utilitarian viewpoint, you could argue that I should withhold the truth and tell a white lie or to obfuscate or not tell the full story because the full details will be needlessly distressing. There's nothing to be gained um, in terms of telling the whole truth. And essentially, if, I, if you don't tell the whole truth, it does increase utility. But hiding elements of the truth is, increases utility and also ex exhibits the principle of non-maleficence to the family member. All right, what about from a virtue ethics standpoint? Um, this could be perceived as being really slippery. In my perspective, it's actually fairly clear, to be honest, because I've seen many clinicians which are, show real virtues and many that really don't show real virtues. All right, so in my opinion, uh, and this is my opinion only, a virtuous clinician would, would wish to not increase distress needlessly, but nor would they wish to lie. So a kind of virtuous telling of the story would be to withhold the distressing details and I think that would be a paradigm example of the good clinician to get that fine balance between telling the excessive truth and hiding all the truth, some sort of golden mean in between. Now, that's called a trite reading of virtue ethics, to be honest. But um, anyway, that's what I think in terms of like, what a really good, a really fine clinician might do with in this instance. All right. Now, of course, this is a, a contrived example. So we don't have the opportunity to talk to fellow clinicians, to talk to family members and, and so forth. And um, also, there's obviously legal and professional implications of obfuscating or telling a white lie, or at least not telling, telling the full truth. These are also important. 
And one thing I want to make really clear in this case study, it's, it is certainly true that it potentially puts the profession into disrepute if a lie is told or the full truth isn't told. But I really want you to think about what would a reasonable person, what would you um, think about the worth of the lie versus the worth of telling the entire truth? All right. Um, I, had to do, I had to dive a lot deeper here because I reflected again upon my reasons for wanting to hide the full facts. Was it purely just moral intuition and wanting to inflict, not wanting to inflict harm, or was there a deeper ethical imperative that was calling to me? So to try and clarify the issue, I considered, I guess, a bit more of a sophisticated way, approach of looking at it. Um, I considered what's called a counterfactual, and that's looking at the opposite circumstance. It's a kind of thought experiment. And again, it's pretty contrived, but it can help to clarify the issue in many ways. So let's consider a thought experiment where one of the family members comes up to you and says, look, my uncle was terribly emotionally abusive to me. I really hope, again, I apologize for my acting. I really hope that he suffered terribly at the end. Can you tell me if this is the case? So the family member wants to know if um, his uncle suffered badly and he would be happy if it was the case. All right. So this is like a counterexample. Now, from a deontological principalist and utilitarian perspective, I thought there's no way out here. In all cases, I should tell the whole truth to this family member. But at this counterfactual, I thought, well, I'll still tell the white lie to all the family members. Not because it'd be harmful to some family members and pleasurable to others, but because I realised I was still acting for the dignity of the patient, even though the patient was deceased. And this counterfactual, this thought experiment, it really clarified my reasoning. Now, I can confidently state that I tend to act to preserve the dignity of patients. Um, and in this instance, to do so, to, in order to do so, I would have to obscure or minimise um, the report of any suffering that the patient had. Because thinking from the patient's perspective, um, the patient and most patients would not want their family members to know that they'd suffered terribly. Moreover, to suffer is an indignity, and um, the public the public report of such indignity um, can be um, shameful and embarrassing to people. So, even though the patient has died, it is still my obligation to act um, in in the for the principle of the patient's dignity. Now, my disposition is to act out of respect for dignity for the patient. And this is a sound ethical principle. And so this is the end result of me applying um, the ethical framework to this problem and to dem and in the demonstration of my ethical reasoning. I'm perfectly comfortable with this position and I'd be willing to defend it really against charges of unprofessionalism. Now, obviously, this has its, and I think this is a really important point, this has its limits. So for example, if in a resource a clinical mistake is made, um, or if the patient's strong, strong patient's family, or the patient, if the patient survives, strongly re request it, we should demonstrate open disclosure for both ethical and legal reasons. Moreover, at a coronial inquest, I'm of the opinion that the overriding duty um, is also veracity rather than the dignity of the patient. So, although in this instance my overriding principle is is dignity uh, of the patient. Um, there are times when the, the principle of veracity would override that. So it's, it is fluid. It does depend completely upon the circumstance um, when you look at all the relevant factors. Now, um, I'm in no way suggesting that this is the answer to the problem, but it is an honest account of my deliberate reasoning about the problem. Or maybe I'm just justifying more moral intuition. Sometimes it's hard to know. But anyway, uh, just just so you know, I ran this same problem um, against uh, with a colleague of mine that I, that I trust, and I gave her the the outline of the moral uh, you know the moral problem, and um, I was keen to hear her um, deliberations upon it. And she got to she got to her um, answer much quicker than I did. I have to say. So initially, she was very very uncomfortable telling the full truth, and I think. You know, I think most nurses you speak to would think the same. It would be horrible just to, to blurt out um, the awful circumstances. So she really quickly rose, um, arose to the principle that she was acting um, on behalf of the patient by still hiding the full um, story of what happened. And her main um, justification was that 
what would the patient want? Would the patient want the family to be really distressed about um, about what happened? So that's a different viewpoint, a similar end result, but a different moral calculus and a different viewpoint. It just shows that, um, you know, all clinicians come with very varying experiences and points of view. And it's not about um, a moral intuition per se. It's about, you know, let's think about this deeply. Let's think of all the circumstances, um, all the context, and come up with a really reasoned response. All right. I hope this has helped. I, what I don't want you to think of that is you must think the way I think or that my colleague thinks. You have your own moral calculations to make. Um, but it just goes to show the difference between type one and type two reasoning and how sometimes it can be an exhaustive and slow process to actually drill down to um, what are your, your core ethical principles and are they justifiable and how do you apply them? So I hope this helped. Cheers.